Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Anup Mahajan. I work at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, which is based in Pune, India. And over here, we basically do a lot of work on prediction of weather and the future climate. In fact, there's a department called the Center for Climate Change Research within IITM, which uh, essentially talks about, uh, which essentially does studies on predicting what's happening in the future. The reason why we think this is important, obviously, is because uh, if we can get our predictions right, uh, then we can actually try and understand what to do about it. Uh, unless we know what's going to happen in the future, it's very difficult to take any actions about it. Uh, this uh, entire series, uh, the virtual COP uh, 20, uh, 25, is focused on trying to get as much information around to as many people as possible. And uh, in India, we are facing very specific problems uh, related to climate change. In fact, several reports talk about how India is probably one of the most vulnerable <coughs> countries, mainly because of its ability to adapt and mitigate the, uh, the effects of climate change. And this is why we are pretty worried about it. And hence, we are putting in a lot of effort in improving the forecast. To start off this uh, session, uh, the 24-hour session, uh, we are going to have three speakers uh, from our side today. And uh, the things that we are going to be focus on, focusing on broadly is on the Indian Ocean and climate, basically the drivers and the effects of climate change related to Indian Ocean and around in India itself. Now, the reason uh, to bring this up and the reason why I think this is pretty important is when you think about the number of people who are getting affected, uh, it's, the statistics are pretty interesting. So uh, around the Atlantic coast, if you consider all the coasts uh, along the Atlantic Ocean, you have about 1.7 billion people living along the coast itself. Compared to that, uh, the Pacific, which is much larger a coastline, uh, has about 2.7 billion people living. The Indian Ocean actually has one of the smallest coastlines uh, compared to the other two big oceans. And still about 2 billion people live along the coastlines at the moment. And of course, these uh, people are living in countries which are not as economically or as, as technologically advanced as some of the countries living along the Pacific or Atlantic. And hence, the chances of them being able to adapt to a changing climate especially a climate which is changing so rapidly is pretty low, which is one of the reasons why we are pretty worried about it. But this is not just important on a regional scale. This is pretty important on a global scale also. And the reason for that is a pretty nice statistic which I heard a couple of weeks ago, which is that three times as many people live along the coast as compared to 1971. So essentially in about 40 years time, we've had a threefold increase in the number of people living along the coast. This just means that we need to be extremely careful about what's going to happen to the coastlines in the future. And the way the coastlines react is the way the oceans themselves react. And we know through lots of data which has been gathered by countries all around the world that the oceans are definitely changing. And this is pretty worrying, especially because they're not changing in a way which is beneficial to human life in most cases. So to talk about this, uh, we're going, going to have three different talks. One is basically talking about the drivers behind the change in the oceans. So whether it's greenhouse gases or whether it's natural variability, we'll understand a little bit about it. What are the uncertainties on those drivers is also something that we'll try and highlight. The second talk will be focusing on what are the impacts on the ocean because of these drivers. So are the oceans warming up or are they cooling down? Are they warming up linearly in the sense that are all the oceans react in this, and reacting in the same way or are there differences in different places? And then finally, we'll have a talk about the impact of these oceans on the atmosphere in terms of are they causing more rainfall? Are they changing storms? Are these cyclones or hurricanes actually increasing or decreasing? And whether we can actually see a signal of climate change on them. So to start off, I won't delay any more and I'll introduce our very first speaker. Our first speaker, he works at uh, IITM itself, uh, Dr. Vinu Valsala. He, he's a scientist and a project di director for the development of skilled manpower desk at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, which is a part of the Ministry of Earth Sciences in India. His major research interests are in oceanography, ocean carbon cycle, ocean biogeochemistry, ecosystem modeling, and ocean data assimilation. He has contributed from India to global uh, ocean carbon budget projects such as the GCP, 
and recap, which give inputs to the IPCC. As you know, the IPCC is the one which consolidates all the research that happens on climate change. He has the lead, uh, sorry, he has led the development of ocean, uh, of global ocean carbon cycle model over OTTM, now widely used in Indian ocean carbon cycle research. So basically he is an expert in the carbon cycle and he'll be taking you through the next few minutes. <laughs> Is it sharing for real? Yes, it should be. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anu. Thank you for a very wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone. So today, uh, uh, my name is Vinu Valsala. So I'm going to uh, talk about the, uh, the, the basic driver of the climate change, which is atmospheric greenhouse gases, which is emitted, uh, additionally emitted by the human causes and, uh, the, and its exchange with the oceans, the atmospheric greenhouse gases and the ocean exchange. So uh, as you may know that uh, we, we have three or four major concerns regarding today's climate change. One is how the man is adding the carbon and dioxide gas to the atmosphere, which is a major greenhouse gas causing today's uh, anthropogenic warming and climate change. So uh, these are some estimates taken from the global carbon project update in 2019 that uh, fossil fuel is the, the, the major emission is around 9.5 petagram carbon per year uh, due to man-made uh, uh, causes and uh, land use change contribute to another 1.3 petagram carbon per year. And uh, however, the biosphere, which is the terrestrial biosphere of the, um, uh, the earth system up sinks nearly uh, three petagram carbon to its uh, interior. So mitigating the, uh, uh, the net buildup of carbon in the atmosphere and further ocean helps to mitigate this by sinking additional uh, 2.4 petagram carbon per year. So as you can see in my uh, monitor uh, in, the, in the screen that uh, there is a systematic buildup of the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide taken from the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory. You see there is a, a steady linear or a quasi linear or a non-linear increase in the carbon dioxide concentration. Now uh, in, in, in the right hand side of this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, slide shows that how the cycling of carbon across various elements in the earth system which involves uh, the fossil fuel emission by uh, industrial activities and uh, bio for, for fossil fuel burning, and then uh, the cycling of carbon to the terrestrial biosphere and uh, into the ocean body or uh, the ocean exchange, and uh, um, um, and that's how the carbon is uh, is redistributing in the earth system. So the the bottom panel shows the net exchange in numbers, which I have highlighted in the top of this uh, picture. So uh, this is a major concern because this is the uh, the, the the fossil fuel emission is ca causing the atmospheric CO2 to build up uh, uh, dramatically. If you compare a value in 1960 you have 320, which itself is a, it's a much exaggerated value compared to what you have in pre-industrial era, which is 278. Now it has gone all the way up to 400 in the global mean. So which is actually causing uh, today's global <coughs> warming. So, uh, well, how do we estimate this carbon exchange or fluxes across the in, in, interfaces of the earth system? And that is important to understand. So there are uh, technological advancement in, in recent days, how we come up with these estimates. Uh, so the left side of this, uh, <clears throat> This slide uh, explains you how a bottom-up approach can be utilized in this case. So bottom-up approach means that based on our wisdom, our, uh, how the process is oriented uh, in the biosphere, in the ocean, in the land use change, etc. how they exchange carbon with the atmosphere. So that's uh, called a bottom-up approach. It's a process-based modeling, ground-based observation, inventory, data, simulation, etc. We'll try to find it out. And in India, we do have a dedicated program by the Space Agency and the Ministry of Earth Sciences to quantify this. And uh, the other approach is the top down. That means you measure the atmospheric carbon in, uh, at various locations using either tower-based or satellite and then come up with certain estimates how this carbon got there. I mean, who emitted it or what was the emission scenario for such a, uh, uh, such, a uh, such observations of carbon in the atmosphere. So that's called the top-down approach. So these are the technological advancement and, uh, um, uh, and, and actively researches are going on in this area to estimates. So now if, you if I talk about the Indian perspective, uh, uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide observation shows that 
that we uh, in the carbon concentration over India also readily increasing. These are the uh, couple of observations that we collect from the India itself, showing from 2009 to 13 for a short period. So we see that uh, various satellite based or the tower based or flask based observation source, there is a systematic buildup of carbon in the environment over India. And uh, this is a station called Sinagat operated uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this, these two stars are kind of displaced in my slides. I'm sorry, this is actually coming on in near Mumbai and another one near Pune. So now the another one is Cape Rama, which is near uh, near Goa. You, you, see, you see that uh, there is also a systematic build of carbon in the atmosphere. So the bottom panel shows how the Indian terrestrial biosphere itself uh, tried to <clears throat> Uh, uh, to sink this carbon uh, it, it, in, in, in certain parts of the months in the year and, uh, and try to emit it back or respire it back to the atmosphere. As you can see, there is a systematic seasonal cycle established in the Indian subcontinental area integrated biospheric flux. So there are uh, seasons where there is an emission or respiration overwhelms these uh, the biospheric sink. And uh, this is from 2000 to 2009 by various estimates collected from various researchers. And the, the, the top left panel uh, shows basically how uh, the uh, for different parts of the season so january february uh, march april may and june july august and october november december how the uh, the biospheric fluxes of carbon is uh, um, a pattern a pattern you can find so in you, you see that uh, in the summer months you will have a larger uh, respiration components because uh, uh, it, it, uh, this also includes the fossil fuel emissions as well. So there's a combination of fossil fuel and biosphere, how the pattern of uh, Indian uh, uh, emission uh, and absorption scenario look like. So now if I go to the ocean, so how the ocean is useful to mitigate this uh, buildup of anthropogenic carbon, which is important to understand. So if you see, uh, this is a, a simplistic cartoon, how the ocean is active in terms of carbon dioxide. So there are various uh, uh, processes, say for example, the, uh, there is an air sea exchange, or this is the ocean part of the cartoon and this is the atmospheric part of the cartoon. So you can see that there's a systematic exchange of gas across the ocean air interface. And uh, the, this is related to the gas exchange by the chemical equilibrium and within the ocean, say up a few hundred, few um, um, tens of meters of the ocean is biologically active. And uh, we all know that biology is a, and biology is basically the photosynthesis, which assimilate the carbon into the biomass and try to reduce the carbon content in the upper ocean. And further, they will be get exported uh, downward to the uh, below of the uh, the ephotic zone. So that there is a pump operating, uh, which is sequestering the carbon from the upper ocean to the interior. And uh, uh, in addition to that, the atmosphere pumps more carbon to the ocean and the ocean also rejects carbon back to the atmosphere according to the oceanic environmental conditions. So this is, uh, this is basically representing two uh, pumps. One is the solubility pump the, and the biological pump, which actually contributes uh, to, 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 to channel the carbon uh, from the atmosphere to ocean and ocean to interior. And uh, however, the dynamics in the ocean uh, replenishes this carbon up and down within the ocean and which uh, maintains a balance or a cycle. So what uh, what we have, uh, have to, to understand is that how the uh, ongoing climate change itself is modifying your oceanic circulation, oceanic environment, for example, which how which further will be modifying our exchanging natural balance of the solubility and biological pump. So understanding this is a key concern to address other ongoing global climate change in terms of carbon. So uh, we, we in, in India, we do have a, a lot of research involved in finding out how the ocean is exchanging the carbon with the atmosphere. See the top panel, you can see that from our research, we produced the, the exchange of carbon dioxide gas between ocean and atmosphere. The blue means the ocean takes up the carbon and the red means the ocean um, ocean rejects the carbon as gas gas in this case so you see that uh, <clears throat> Uh, there are um, uh, patches in the ocean surface where the large sink of carbon you see the and the, purple, the magenta and purple color in this uh, in, in this movie you see that in the top panel you see how the carbon gas is going into the ocean and the red color however indicates the how the carbon is outgassing from the ocean so there if you look at the tropical pacific which is uh, almost half of our um, uh, i mean um, the pacific ocean which is half of almost half of our global uh, uh, surface you see that the large emissions of carbon from the uh, tropical regions of the Pacific you can see and however in the North Atlantic or in the North Pacific you see there is a, a lot of sink of carbon is established they seasonally vary and if you see that there is a trend of uh, carbon sink which is uh, shown in just below the, the the first movie you can see there's a systematic line building up from 1980 to 2004 which is showing that the ocean carbon sink is increasing the reason is that uh, the buildup of atmospheric carbon is uh, is increasing because of fossil fuel emission which causes the ocean 
ocean to sequestrate more carbon. So that's how the ocean helps to mitigate the uh, ongoing climate change by uh, naturally taking carbon, additional carbon from the atmosphere, but human uh, are adding to it. So the bottom, but uh, there is a consequence to that because once you know that uh, when the carbon dissolves in the ocean, the water turns acidic. So this is a major concern. So I have produced a, a movie for the uh, acidification of the surface ocean. So that's actually the, uh, the one of the, um, uh, the, the, the negative impact of the, uh, say the uh, taking up of carbon uh, from the atmosphere by the ocean. The negative impact in the ocean is that the acidity increases. The bottom panel, you can see that uh, the acidity of the ocean is continuous. This is uh, the, the more, uh, I mean, the, 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 low, the lower part of this plot is a more acidified condition. The upper part is more alkaline condition. So the acidity is uh, linearly increasing in the global ocean. So inconsistent with uh, what ocean is absorbing uh, from the atmosphere. So now uh, coming back to the Indian Ocean scenario, so we uh, do have a, a lot of research recently in the Indian Ocean to estimate how the air sea exchange is established. This is the exchange of carbon dioxide gas between ocean and atmosphere. This is the Indian Ocean sector. You can see that uh, during the summer, we have a large emissions of carbon from the Western Indian Ocean. However, during winter months, we have a very mild emissions of carbon. Uh, uh, on an year average, if you uh, talk about this uh, uh, Indian Ocean, uh, tropical Indian Ocean at least access a mild uh, source of carbon to the atmosphere. So today, this is a kind of a mean produced from last 20 years from today. So now if you go further, what are the challenges in assessing the capacity of ocean to mitigate the global climate change by offering a natural sink? If you look at these numbers, which also come up from various research across the globe, so that the Indian Ocean carbon sink, we can see that it's an year long sink is a, a roughly minus on the 0.3 to 0.2. And uh, it has, uh, uh, however, some uncertainty <coughs> exists with this. And this uncertainty is due to the lack of observations and limitations in our understanding how the ocean is changing to the climate and how the ocean is changing its capacity to take up carbon from the atmosphere. So they all add up to these uh, uncertainties here. And uh, further researchers are going on to improve on these uncertainties and come up with the robust estimate how the ocean is absorbing carbon today and how that is going to change in future now <laughs> Before I have, before we, because I have just introduced the concept of acidification, it's a simple cartoon again. How the ocean is getting acidified when it absorbs carbon dioxide. If you see, if the carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean, by basically it converts into carbonic acid H2CO3, and which which is highly unstable and then split into bicarbonate and then bicarbonate split into carbonate. So each of these uh, uh, um, dissolution will result in finally uh, a release of uh, H2 H plus ion in this total. So as the number H plus ion increases, the acid acidity of the ocean is also increases. So uh, when the acidity increases, for example, the shell bearing organisms may not be able to survive because their shell or skeleton may disintegrate as the ocean get more acidified. And these, uh, um, bio, uh, this, uh, this, this, this cartoon of shell bearing uh, organism is uh, symbolizing the biospheric activity or biological activity or photosynthesis in the upper ocean. So if they cannot survive in an acidified condition, they may, um, they, the total bi um, biological pump in the ocean also will get affected and ocean's capacity to mitigate carbon from the atmosphere may further change drastically if the acidification increases. So now uh, this is the scenario of the Indian Ocean acidification as you see in the in the plot here or in the picture here that uh, <clears throat> Ocean is uh, and the more blue color means a more acidic condition and more red color means more alkaline condition. So the Western Arabian Sea is one of the area where we have a more acidic condition existing in the in the mean and in today's uh, scenario. And uh, this is a major concern because acidity is a, is directly related to the, the environmental condition, which is the surface temperature of the water. Because the dissolution of carbon carbonic acid into carbonate and bicarbonate further get get enhanced because they are endothermic reactions. So as the temperature of the ocean increases, they can also get increased. So recently, Indian Ocean is also warming in an alarming rate, which also actually accelerating the acidification condition. So here in this uh, uh, slide, uh, we we highlighted uh, in, in uh, one of our recent research is that. Uh, as the, uh, the, the SST components of the acidity trend in the Indian Ocean is quite alarming. If you see the SST, in uh, the, the more the SST has a trend in last 50 years, the trend in pH is also linearly related to it. Even if you split into various season like January, February, March, or October, November, December, this trend is consistent and they are increasing. That means there is a chance, this is actually a for feedback to climate change by the, uh, the ocean. I mean, the ocean is now reacting back to the climate change by the acidity, acidification, and uh, increase uh, increasing temperature also accelerate uh, the tendency towards an acidic situation in the ocean. Now, uh, 
to uh, to conclude i would say that uh, <clears throat> anthropogenic emissions of the carbon dioxide is the major reason to increase of atmospheric mole fraction of carbon dioxide and global warming and oceans and terrestrial biosphere however today offering to mitigate the co2 build up by uh, sinking atmospherically uh, atmos uh, 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 approximately 50 percentage and uh, con total contribution i mean atmos ocean and atmosphere together uh, sinking 50 percentage of what is emitted by man however uh, climate change and its feedback may adversely affect the present sink of terrestrial biosphere and the oceans so uh, this is this is an area of active research and if you are if you have any comments and questions, uh, I can answer either online or in the data through email. So we may contact here. And uh, thank you. Great. Uh, let me just stop the share. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vino. Uh, if you can move back a little bit, maybe we can have a small discussion. Uh, first of all, are there any questions from the audience here? Uh, please remember that you can uh, ask questions on the link provided or on YouTube right now. So we can answer them live if you want. If not, uh, Vinu has already put on his uh, email address over there. So you can always contact him later for, for some of the answers also. Uh, I, Vinu, I had one question about it. Uh, so one of the things you mentioned was the ocean is doing a pretty good job at well, reducing the impact of the anthropogenic CO2, which is being pumped in the atmosphere right. because it's absorbing. Right. Right? Right. But you also mentioned that the biological pump, which essentially takes the CO2 from the top of the ocean into the bottom, so sequesters it out of the system, that might <laughs> reduce in the future. Right. So, so is there a, a threshold? Is there like a time when you think it can flip over and it will it will stop sequestering carbon from the atmosphere to make things worse? Well, there are people talking about the tipping point, how the ocean may uh, drastically reduce its capacity to sequester further from the atmosphere. So it depends upon how the feedbacks are kicking in. I mean, when the, uh, when the buildup of the carbon in the atmosphere itself increases, we change the ocean uh, dynamics and ocean uh, environment parameters, which is like temperature, the alkalinity of the system, etc. So uh, they are not really very well understood when actually this tipping point may happen, but there are uh, identified that by 2050, the saturation of this uh, calcium carbonate and aragonate in the oceans may reach a saturation level at the southern part of the oceans, especially. But by when? Uh, by 2050, for example. So that's the today's model projection. And right. 21 to 2100, it may be drastically, the global ocean may be replacing most of the that is south and south of that will be highly unsaturated uh, uh, value, values or values may be coming. So <clears throat> uh, this is a major concern. And, uh, but uh, this, there is no clear answer actually when the ocean really are going to turn into a source uh, by reducing its biological pump or the solubility pump. Sure. But uh, it is anticipated that the, uh, the, the, the more alarming is that the global climate change, which change the atmospheric winds and the circulation of the ocean, which may further enhance the outgassing, what has been already absorbed and so sink into the interior. And if that outgassing will further accelerate the global warming. So we don't have an exact uh, calendar date that when is this going to happen, but there are speculations by global climate simulation saying that by 2030, 2050 are critical periods when you will see that uh, there is a uh, lot of uh, <coughs> undersaturations of these uh, calcium bearing shell organisms situations happens uh, in the extreme south and north of the oceans. So this is pretty worrying because now we are talking about dates that are within our lifetimes. Uh, yes, uh, they, that is true. Or if it is not in our lifetime, then the immediate next generation will be saying the consequence. Of right. So the younger people have to be a little more worried be. about it. We have a question online also um, from Axel in Paris, who is asking, uh, do you have estimates of how much more degrees the ocean can handle? Uh, degrees uh, in they, temperature. Uh, I mean, the ocean warming can go up to what extent? Before it flips over. Uh, well, I don't think I have already answer for that. <laughs> uh, well, I don't completely understand what the implication of the question is, whether it's asking how the ocean could warm until it tip over the climate or until it tip over on their ecosystem balance. Well, if it is talking about the ecosystem balance, uh, say, for example, all the marine bio, bio, uh, um, uh, biomass production, etc., depends upon certain uh, um, uh, optimal temperature conditions. If that, uh, that the temperature conditions are already in a balance in the existing climate, and they're very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Suppose a one degree net warming in the upper, upper few, hundred, few tens of meters can drastically reduce the biomass production. That's what right. our simulations show. 
So temperature dependency of the biomass is, uh, I mean, photosynthesis is very, very important. Right. And uh, so the, uh, it can, uh, the, the relation is not linear. There, there, usually the, the growth increases and there's a saturation, then there is a decline. Mm -hmm. So this type of function exists in the, in the biosphere. So a one to two degree after the threshold will be change will be very drastic. Okay. So yeah, maybe uh, uh, further warming by uh, two degree in the upper hundred, which is which is, may happen in another uh, few tens of years or twenty fifty, may be quite uh, uh, dangerous to the atmosphere. So, for example, when they say in the atmosphere we should try and keep the temperature below one point five degrees of an increase, uh, that's yes. what uh, the cu countries are trying to do, and not right. some similar number needs to be given for the ocean for to to handle the yeah. oceanic change. Yes, yeah, certainly. If you are concurring with the current findings and projections done by the climate models, then we do have no other option but to uh, mitigate uh, or try to really cut down our emissions and uh, maintain what is. Uh, up what what is be set as certain limits right. within the next uh, 50 to 100 years there are two questions in youtube yeah uh, please go so one question is from shikasin are the oceans absorbing less now as compared to past ha huh, that's a good question see ocean uh, yeah, the question here is that the, are the ocean absorbing uh, less as compared to the past? Well, ocean is still continuing to absorb, um, uh, the, the, I mean, the absorption capacity is still increasing. The reason being the atmospheric buildup is uh, even overwhelming than the, what is happening in the ocean. So it is increasing. But in certain part of the ocean, however, due to the dynamic consequence in the ongoing anthropogenic uh, climate change, uh, certain parts of the ocean, the sink capacity is declining. Southern Ocean is one of the serious concerns where uh, people are still debating sink is increasing or decreasing, or it is modulated by large decadal variability, which is contributed by dynamics and which is changing by the climate change. Right. So this is all are interlinked. There's a no clear cut answer. Ocean is really declining its capacity, but sink is decelerating. <coughs> that be much we can say. Sink is decelerating in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a slight manner that so we can see in recent. The ocean cannot handle as much yes, as Yes, uh, ocean would. is not a solution for the climate. Right. <laughs> yeah, can. there is uh, one more question, last question. Uh, is from Rakesh Ghosh. He is asking if upwelling can release carbon dioxide from ocean to atmosphere. Yes, certainly. Ocean has already sequestrated uh, quite a huge amount of what man emitted so far. If the upwelling changes mm -hmm. in the climate change, this upwelling intensifies. This is what happens in the in the southern part of the ocean, southern ocean, where the western is intensified by global change. If that happens, upwelling enhances, which can outcast whatever is being absorbed. So that is definitely a possibility. So it can come back to come back to us, uh, and, uh, and yes, and then it will uh, further accelerate our global warming because uh, then it's become all known. In we are still emitting, ocean is still uh, emitting back what is absorbed, then it will build up and uh, can be an even bigger acceleration. Right. Great. Thank you so much, yeah, Thank you, uh, Anup. Thank you for the audience and. Uh, yeah, it's all yes, sir. And as I mentioned, uh, if you have questions uh, uh, later, you can always email Vinu or uh, get in touch with, with us or through YouTube, etc. Now, uh, as we saw, the drivers for climate change are essentially CO2, and that itself is changing quite a few things. And one of the most important things, at least according to me, that Vinu mentioned was uh, the oceans also have a tipping point in terms of temperature beyond which it might not be as sustainable in terms of sequestering the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is actually a pretty good segue for, to our next talk, uh, which is going to be given by Dr. Roxy Matthew Cole. And uh, let me just introduce Roxy very quickly. He is currently a leading researcher on climate change and its impact on the rapid warming in the Indian Ocean, the change in monsoon, which is the weather phenomena which drives agriculture, et cetera, in India, and the marine ecosystem. He is a co-chair on the uh, Clive Indian Ocean Region Panel and is a lead author on the IPCC Special Re uh, Report on Oceans and Cryosphere in the Changing Climate. And uh, Roxy will be talking about extremes over the ocean and land, which is related to the temperature changes that we are seeing in the ocean itself. So with that, uh, I'll pass you on to Roxy and he'll take you further for this talk. <clears throat> Hi guys, a very good morning. So here uh, we will see how the oceans 
and the earth system in general is uh, taking up the, uh, the enhanced emissions of carbon dioxide. So where is the impact larger? Is it over the tropics? Um, and who is going to get impacted the maximum? So here you can see a very popular picture from the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the IPCC, which synthesized the uh, research on climate change over the past several, uh, several decades. And this shows where the heat, the additional heat from increased emissions has gone into. As you can see, the additional heat has gone into the earth system components in a non-uniform manner. Particularly, uh, we can have a look at the blues here. The blues shows the that the oceans have absorbed the largest share of the heat. That's around 90% or more heat absorbed due to increased carbon dioxide emissions. Meanwhile, the abs absorption of heat over the ice, the land, and the atmosphere all together are less than 10%, which tells us that we should be worried about the oceans. As the last speaker talked talk to us, if uh, the oceans get much more warmer, the oceans can release much more carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere rather than acting as a sink. So let's see how the oceans are taking up the heat. So we all know the oceans are a big, <clears throat> big deep reservoir of liquid with high heat capacity. And ocean heat gain is in the last three or four decades is at a rate of eight zeta joules. So here is some interesting calculation on how much heat the ocean is absorbing. So if we imagine all the electricity we produce yearly and multiply that by 150. That is how much heat the oceans absorb annually. Now, I talked about the uneven absorption of heat among the earth system components, but even in the oceans, this heat absor absorption is uneven. For example, you can see the picture here, which shows that though all ocean basins are warming continuously, some are warming more than others, especially in the recent decades. You can see the, with the green color shows that the Indian Ocean is warming much more rapidly. And this is the warming, not just in the surface, but for the first 700 meters from the surface. So all the basins are warming, but some are warming much more than the others. And to have a special uh, feeling of the uh, of the warming over these ocean basins, we have a look at the tropics, how the sea surface temperatures have changed over the tropics. You have the Indian Ocean here, you have the Pacific Ocean here and the Atlantic. And these are the mean sea surface temperatures. You can see from 10 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius. Generally, the equator and the Indo-Pacific region is covered by a region called the warm pool, where you have temperatures or sea surface temperatures, SSDs, about 28 degrees Celsius. And this is a picture from 1900 to 1918 for different seasons, because the warm temperatures change their location according to the season. And so the changes are also different according to the season. So if you look at the summer, the north end summer, 1900 to 1980, you can see a particular distribution of the warm pool region and the warm sea surface temperatures. And how has it changed during the recent decades since 1980s? You can see the warm temperatures have increased over the Indian region and the West Pacific region as well. There are some changes over the Atlantic also, but if you want to have a clear picture on how it has changed, you need to look at the trends. So here we come into the trends during the uh, long time period and the short time period over the tropics. So this is for summer during the long 
same period. You can see the Atlantic has warmed, but the Indian Ocean also has warmed. So this is the Indian Ocean region where you have the largest warming during the long term period for the northern summer when you have the monsoons active over the, over the Indian subcontinent region. And at the same time, if you look at the SSG trends for the recent decades, you can see the trends are large there also, but the distribution of the trends have changed. So these changes in sea surface temperatures can have an impact on the Asian monsoon. It can have an impact on sea level changes because most of the sea level changes in the tropics could be attributed to the uh, expansion of water due to uh, thermal, thermal expansion of water. And these temperatures also have an impact on extreme rain and floods across the Indian Ocean rim countries or South Asia and Southeast Asia. They have an impact on the marine ecosystem and so on. Now, uh, any guess on what this animal is? So this is a melamy, it looks like a rat, but it is the first species, uh, mammalian species to be extinct due to anthropogenic climate change. So this also happened in the fringes of Indian Ocean. Uh, in the East Indian Ocean, due to increasing sea level. So here in the West Pacific or the Indo-Pacific Indo region, you have a sea level rise of seven millimeter per year, which is more than twice the global average. So coupled with extreme tides and storm surges, this, uh, the island where the mellow is occupied was inundated in a short period, driving the species to extinction. And the sea level rise, so here it shows that the sea level rise is around seven millimeter per year. And this is double the global mean average. It uh, shows that the sea level changes have regional implications as well. And it can be different at different regions. And one of the major reason is the warming of the Indo-Pacific region. And here's an interesting picture which shows how vulnerable the Indian Ocean region is. Now, this, this uh, is a special uh, picture of the geographical locations. You can see they are stretched or squeezed based on population. And that shows the vulnerability of the population with respect to increasing sea level and other extremes. And most of these regions, as Anu told in the beginning slides, uh, these regions have low to middle income nations or small island nations, which are largely vulnerable uh, to increasing extremes over the Indian Ocean. Now, let's come into some uh, new extremes, which, are, uh, which have been unveiled in the recent IPCC report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. So one of these extremes are the marine heat waves. We may not have heard about heat waves uh, in the ocean sometime back. So these are heat waves in, like over the land, but in the ocean. And these are happening much more. And this is a picture from 2015, 16, when there were multiple heat waves over the ocean. So many of these red colors indicate heat waves. And these dots show where he had a subsequent coral bleaching. So some are severe bleaching. You can see the purple colors or the pink colors showing severe bleaching and some moderate bleaching. And most of this bleaching occurred over the Indian region or the Indo-Pacific region. As you all know, coral reefs occupy less than 1% or 0.1% of the global surface. But more than 25% of the biodiversity, marine diversity is in the coral reefs. But this incessant warming and marine heat waves can lead them to uh, large scale bleaching and suppression of these corals. And model projections shows that the marine heat wave frequency can increase further. So if in the pre-industrial conditions, they were like one in every 100 days uh, with a 1.5 degree Celsius warming, uh, it can increase from increase to one in every six days or with a 3.5 degree Celsius warming, it, it can increase from to one in every two days, which is quite large. Uh, similarly, uh, this can have an impact on marine productivity as well. 
Uh, as you can see, the Indian Ocean is blessed with a large upwelling region with a lot of marine productivity shown as red colors over here compared to other regions in summer. But due to increasing sea surface temperatures, there is a recorded decline, corresponding decline in the marine productivity, which can impact the fisheries. And coming to land, extremes over the land, this ocean warming has shown that there is an impact on monsoon droughts as well. So here the blue color shows flood years and the red color shows the drought years. As you can see in the earlier period, in the first 50 years, you have intermittent flood and drought years, but the number of drought years are increasing much more in the recent years. And studies have shown that there is a strong connection between monsoon circulation and the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures. And correspondingly, uh, it is puzzling to see that there is a, though the total monsoon rains are uh, decreasing, there is a corresponding increase in the number of monsoon extremes as well. So this brings us to the question on how it is going to change in the future. Well, uh, the models show that the monsoon extreme rainfall events are going to increase, but we have a low confidence on the decrease on or the continued decrease in monsoon rains total monsoon rains in the future. But uh, we have more insights on uh, tropical cyclones, how tropical cyclones are changing, changing in a warming Indian Ocean. And uh, that's it for uh, the changes in the Indian Ocean. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you, Vino. Uh, sorry, thank you, Roxy, that was, uh, that was pretty, Worrying a trend. Uh, so uh, most people keep hearing about the Arctic Ocean and how yeah. that is really, it's the fastest heating ocean in the world. Yeah. Uh, is the Indian Ocean the second fastest heating uh, besides the Arctic or are there other parts of the world which are heating as fast? Yeah. The, so the significance of Indian Ocean comes when you see the mean temperatures as well. So if you look at the tropics, Indian Ocean is the warmest. Right. Yeah. I'm not talking about the trends but it's the warmest. So the temperatures are mostly about 20 degrees Celsius. It can support large convection. So these trends are on top of that. Okay. So if you, and if you look at the tropical oceans alone, the trends are the largest in the Indian Ocean. Right. Yeah, so, but if you want to compare with the poles, uh, it may be the second fastest warming ocean basin. Right. And in terms of the future, is there, you know, as Vinu said, uh, there's a tipping point for when uh, the CO2 starts getting sequestered uh -huh. or not. Uh -huh. Is there a tipping point in terms of the temperature in the Indian Ocean where it will just do like a runaway heating or is this still being being mitigated by, by the other oceans as in is the heat getting dissipated into the other oceans or it's going to stay around there itself? Yeah, so time and again, we are, we are seeing that the Indian Ocean is absorbing a lot of heat. Like recent research shows that uh, even when there was a uh, tiny slowdown in the global surface heat, uh, we saw that a lot of heat was stored uh, or diverted from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. So it is storing a lot of heat, but we don't know how it uh, might act in the next uh, 100 years, but we know that there is already changes uh, in the uh, meridional overturning circulation uh, due to increasing uh, sea surface temperatures or ocean temperatures in the Indian Ocean. Right. Yeah. So even if uh, the far off future is uncertain, your point is that the changes are already being already, manifested yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and we need to start worrying about them yeah. immediately. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roxy. Thank you. That was a really insightful uh, talk. So for the last uh, talk, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mehta to join us. Uh, now, the reason for choosing this last talk, which is a little further away from what is traditionally known as ocean sciences, is because of uh, what Roxy just said, is that the oceans are storing a lot more heat than in the past. And all of this heat eventually does interact with the ocean, uh, with the atmosphere.
So if you have a warmer ocean, the chances are that the atmosphere just above the ocean is going to get more energy and, and that is going to manifest itself in terms of storms. So for that, we're going to have Meta, and she's going to talk about the changing status of tropical cyclones over the Northern, uh, North Indian Ocean. Just to give you a quick bio, Meta is a scientist at uh, the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune, India, and she is doing research on the genesis and intensification of tropical cyclones over the North Indian Ocean. Currently, she's involved in the development of a high-resolution ensemble prediction system for probabilistic prediction of tropical cyclones. So basically trying to improve our cyclone predictions, which, uh, as she'll show, has really happened in India over the last few years. Neda, if you want to come and start. I'm sorry, just give me a second. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Anup, and very good morning to all of you. Uh, as Anup said, I'll be talking about the tropical cyclones, the current status over the North Indian Ocean. I'll start with the uh, today's uh, satellite image. This is today's satellite image obtained from the IMD InSight image. And you can see there are four active systems over the Indian Ocean, two in the South Indian Ocean and two in the North Indian Ocean. So these are the four active systems over the Indian Ocean. Now, uh, to give a brief background about uh, my talk, like you all know the typhoons over Pacific Ocean, hurricanes over Atlantic Ocean, the same systems are called as tropical cyclones over North Indian Ocean. And in the North Indian Ocean, comparatively, the share is less. It's about 7% of the total, total global activity over the North Indian Ocean. And you can see that this is the uh, distribution of tropical cyclones uh, with respect to the months. You can see that Indian Ocean has the double peak characteristic, one peak in the pre-monsoon season in the month of May and another peak in the month of November in the post-monsoon season. And uh, on average, about five to six systems reach at least the tropical storm stage. That's about 35 knots or more. And North Indian Ocean is divided into two basins, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. And as per the historic records and the climatology, Bay of Bengal is actively dominating in number of cyclones compared with the Arabian Sea. It's about four times higher than the Arabian Sea. Now, this is this year's cyclones. And this year is one of the most active North Indian Ocean season on record. And each cyclone is, I can say, it, it's like a record breaker cyclone. We had about, we have till the season is going on and one system is still active in Arabian Sea. We have about eight systems named storms on record and six out of them have been intensified into a very severe cyclonic storm and one super cyclonic storm, Kyar. And you can see that as I said, as per the climatology, the number is more for uh, Bay of Bengal than Arabian Sea. But this year we have experienced about five storms in Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, there are three storms. Now, uh, talking about the last year's experience, we had two simultaneous storms at a time in both the basins of North Indian Ocean, Luban in the Arabian Sea and Titli in the Bay of Bengal. And interestingly, and uh, we can say that both of them intensified rapidly at the same time reached the maximum intensity as a very severe cyclonic storm. And the rate of intensification was very rapid. It was about 30, more than 30 knots in a day. And this actually is very threatening, we can say. And this type of cases are not very usual. You can see that there are about six cases in past 40 years happened like this, like simultaneous occurrence of uh, cyclones over both the basins. But among these six cases, the 2018 is a very peculiar because both, both the systems attended the very severe cyclonic storm stage. So both became intense, both rapidly intensified. So with this experience, we obviously have one question in mind. Does the cyclone activity changing over the North Indian Ocean? Now to link with the SST, we all know that cyclones form over the ocean and uh, the ocean provides the source for the energy of the cyclone. And you can see that this is uh, based on the past 40 years data for both the basins. 
we can see that there is an increasing trend in the sea surface temperature. Talking about the atmospheric component, which is the response of this uh, hot water is the moist static energy. That is also increasing over the years, starting from 1979 to the 2018 for both the basins. Now coming to the seasonal variability of the sea surface temperature and the, um, uh, for Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, we can see there is a increasing trend in both these parameters. Now, this is the relation of sea surface temperature and moist static energy. Sea surface temperature and uh, tropical cyclone heat potential, we can see that it's directly uh, positively correlated. Higher is the SST, more is the moist static energy, more is the tropical cyclone heat potential, and we can expect more cyclones with the higher uh, sea surface temperature. Now, these are the actual numbers of the cyclones formed over both the basins from past 40 years data. I have selected the satellite era data only because there are discrepancies between uh, in the previous uh, pre-satellite era data about the cyclones. So 79 onwards to 2018, we can see that in the Bay of Bengal, there is a decreasing trend, but in the Arabian Sea, the, there is slight increasing trend. And the trend is, um, is not that significant because the numbers, is, numbers are already less. In the Arabian Sea, uh, normally the frequency of cyclones is very less. Now, when we divide this 40 years into 20, 20 years, past 20 and recent 20, you can say that Bay of Bengal, the cyclones have been decreased, but Arabian Sea slight increase in the number of cyclones. Now, each uh, season wise, I'm showing this distribution. This is the Arabian Sea annual frequency total in the year. These are the cyclonic storms and these are the severe cyclonic storms. It's very clear that the cyclonic storms has been increased in the annual frequency in the past 20, compared with past 20 years. Now the major contribution is from the pre-monsoon season. We can see here in this plot, the pre-monsoon, the number of cyclones has been increased drastically. The uh, monsoon season is almost same. And the Arabian Sea post-monsoon storms are also like almost same in past 20, but the pre-monsoon, there is a drastic increase in the number of cyclones. In Bay of Bengal, there is decrease in number of cyclones in all the seasons. Now, I'll, uh, so it's about like from long-term trend, the trend is not that significant as the frequency is very less over the Arabian Sea, but we can see that when we divide the 40 years in 2020 years, there are more number of cyclones in Arabian Sea and this is alarming, I think. The positive part is that in recent years, the death toll due to the cyclones has been reduced over NIO. It's, it, it is about less than 100 in recent years compared with the uh, about thousands in the past cases. And the credit goes to many things, but still the evacuation, the life get disturbed when the people get evacuated from the region. The life could be, life have been saved, but there is a lot of stress on the system when these kind of events happen. So I'll end with this. Thank you, Veda. Uh, we'll just stop the screen from sharing. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is pretty interesting. So as I understand from the data, there is absolutely no doubt that the number of storms are increasing. However, you mentioned that in the Bay of Bengal, some of the storms have stayed the same or reduced in number. Yes. Why, why is that non-linearity happening? Uh, actually, the uh, both the oceans behave differently because uh, their salinity is different, their uh, mixed depth is different. So that contributes to the number of cyclones and that is still the research area. Why in the Bay it is reducing and increasing in the Arabian Sea? research so it's there's still some uncertainty, some uncertainty around it uh, but what do the future predictions show is this trend going to continue in the sense the west of the country is going to get more and more yeah that's intense? what i understand from the all the work which have been done on the, this topic that there the frequency may not change much but there will be more intense cyclone in the future Okay, so, so the number itself uh, might not change, might but, not change, but the, the size of the cycle si the intensity, intensity. The wind and rain mainly the destruction happens, no? so that may increase. Right. Uh, you mentioned uh, one pretty important point over there, uh, saying that uh, the number of people uh, or the number of fatalities has reduced drastically, but the number of storms is still increasing. Uh, is this attributable mainly to better predictions on which the government can act, or are people more more attuned to what to do during storms. Actually, both are important. 
now the confidence on the prediction has also been built on uh, the prediction so people also uh, obey the means listen to the warnings and follow the warnings and all and the predictions have been improved a lot that's mainly because of the improvement in the numerical models the resources available high computing resources are available and the disaster management management systems policies also have been improved so it's their credit but still the there is more, much stress on the whole system when the cyclone comes right so one of the questions most people tend to have uh, who haven't been working on this field is you know exactly how are you improving the models uh, as you mentioned the models have improved uh, you've started doing numerical prediction what exactly does that mean and in in your introduction i had mentioned that you're working on an ensemble forecast yes, yes, what, yes. what do these things mean actually for now the future for all the predictions is the probabilistic prediction because in the deterministic way nature doesn't behave in the deterministic way can you tell so us what that means it's like probability? there is a there uh, the model is basically starts with the initial condition initial condition is the source of data now there are errors in the initial condition we cannot produce the best initial condition so there is a limit on that so to get the possible uh, the best possible initial conditions the ensemble has been done it's like a, one initial condition is per term and in all possible uncertainties has been captured into that initial condition so that will get the number of possible say in terms of track if i am talking the deterministic model will give me one track of the cyclone now if i run the ensemble of model i'll get the probable tracks of the cyclone and if those members are with each other means they are aligned in the same direction so i'm confident about my prediction otherwise if there is a huge spread in the ensemble i can wait for the next update and the next update will give me the accurate forecast so ensemble helps in the prediction it gives the additional information along with the value like like you may ask like tomorrow is it going to rain now i cannot tell how much it can rain because model has the limitation but we can tell that how much chance of getting this much rain it is possible through this ensemble prediction system and i feel that we have done this in iitm and the system has been handed over to the operation centers and like many people are working on it so as i understand ironically constraining the errors while you're running the models makes it much better in terms of your confidence in understanding the, the errors in the prediction can give the much uh, better prediction right and for this obviously we need a lot more computation yes, system obviously. which is why the models are getting models better are as the technology yes. improves itself the other question i had was so you're talking about these intensification of of these big storms uh, do they have major impacts on the hydrological cycle in terms of a uh, annual spread so you know would these change the amount of rainfall that you're getting over india or or the surrounding nations there are uncertainties in this like maybe the total rain may not have the impact but the amount of rain in one span like the cyclone will bring lot of rain in one span of time no? Yeah. So the total may not change much, but the amount and especially uh, very focused rain events are increasing. That is well. Known. Yeah, that is true. Actually, uh, you know, studies by Goswami, even yeah, Roxy, etc., they have shown that uh, the total amount of rainfall over the Central India uh, region actually is it's, reducing. Yes. But the number of heavy rainfall heavy rain events rain are yeah. are increasing, yes. and that can would do you think that can be tied to the Because, ocean heat directly? Yes. Because there's more yes. energy in the system itself. Yes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time to ask it on uh, on YouTube. Uh, do you guys uh, have? Yes. Yeah. There is one question from Rakesh Bosch. How does a global warming climate be related to static stability changes and tropical cyclone intensification in the future? Generally, how how does global warming uh, lead to tropical cyclone intensification in the future? Would you like to answer that? Uh, how does global warming lead to more Actually, or intensification of cyclones? Wa global warming, like as Roxy said, the oceans are warming. So, warmer ocean will provide the uh, source of energy for the tropical cyclone through the fluxes exchange, and that is the directly linked. And again, the air temperature is also increasing. So, uh, along with that goes uh, ocean temperature. So, higher is the temperature of the air, more moisture it can hold. so whenever it will the system will form it will rain more and that's what in the cyclone also it happens so that's why the more intense cyclone will so basically there's more energy in the ocean, ocean. so there's more moisture more going moisture out going the air is warmer so it can hold more moisture. moisture and then when it starts to rain all this moisture comes out yes. in, in a few weeks
That's great. Uh, Vino, do you want to come here? We'll have a very quick discussion before, before we wrap up. Yeah. Mina, you'll have to restrict the word for us. So, uh, okay. So the entire point of having this discussion is to try and uh, uh, try and give like a small little summary of what what this current scenario is and what to expect in the future. So, uh, from all of your sides, would you agree that well, global warming itself is really changing the way the oceans are reacting, and that is leading to atmospheric effects? Well, global warming, of course, has to do with the, how the ocean is changing. And not just the physical change, but the other sectors of the ocean. Either you say the chemistry change, because uh, warming is related to the cell in chemical Biological change, because warming is related to how the optimal temperature for biomass production, respiration capacities in the oceans, and uh, uh, <clears throat> etc. Physical change, further feedback to this because the ocean is more warm, more static, and as biology of paper says, pumping up the nutrient back to the productive zone will happen. So, uh, as you say that. So it is definitely that uh, uh, the global warming has a take a toll on ocean, not just the physics, but chemistry, biology, and geology as well, perhaps because if uh, we take the long term balance, how all this uh, system got evolved, and uh, the <coughs> uh, geologically, uh, also the geological part also has a role in regulating our climate, but it can get better. Say, for example, how the ions are being brought into ocean from the, from the rocks or from the earth, the mm -hmm. uh, rain flow and uh, that the weathering of the rocks supplies the ions for the ocean. And uh, this, uh, the climate is changing, and uh, the, 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 the capacity of rain to gather the rocks. So, for example, index rain or low rain or the rain water, uh, the, the composition of chemical content in the say, is it more acidic, more weathering. More ions going from. So all are coupled. Uh, see, if you just pick one and everything else going to have its uh, like pulses going around. Yeah. This is what uh, people say. Okay, one minute uh, summary of. Uh, yeah, so one of the points after after listening to everyone's talk and uh, of course my own uh, insight is that we need much more observations and improvement in the models itself. Because even if we take different, uh, one of the best uh, observed product in the Indian Ocean is the sea surface temperature. But there is a large spread between observations itself. Yeah, and models, I mean, it's huge. Each model show the SST distribution different. Uh, so if the case of SST is like that, uh, the case of uh, carbon fluxes is much more huge. We don't have any observations. I mean, long-term observations or widespread observations across the Indian Ocean. So I think we need to focus uh, a bit more on monitoring the Indian Ocean because uh, the Indian Ocean is, uh, uh, is giving us signals that is changing largely and we need to monitor it well so that we can forecast it. Meda, a uh, quick summary of what you think is... Different. Like, I would like to uh, quote one sentence uh, by Professor Kerry Emanuel last, uh, this month only he visited to our institute, and he was saying that, like, the climate change is not the far future, but now we are experiencing that. And in terms of cyclones, I think many of us will agree that we are experiencing that. Thank you so much, uh, you guys. Uh, it was very nice of you to give the talks. Hopefully, the listeners have also learned something through all of this. Uh, the basic point is, uh, as uh, Roxy was mentioning, we do need uh, more observations to improve our, uh, our confidence. However, with the current uh, confidence itself, we are seeing the effects of climate change, especially through the interaction of the ocean and the atmosphere itself. With that, we would like to end the session from uh, India. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, our contact details will be made available to you. Uh, feel free to send us an email about any of these changes. This session was particularly focused on the physical aspects of climate change, uh, what the data itself shows. But through the different talks, some of them focus even on the societal impacts, et cetera. So please uh, stay tuned and uh, listen to the other sessions which are following. I should mention that the next session will start at 7 a.m.
according to the Central European time. So that's in about half an hour. And that session will be from the Philippines. So speak, please stay tuned and, uh, and listen to the future sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank for all of us.